I would like to thank California Thoracic Society and Beringer Ingerheim for allowing us to put together this series in interstitial lung diseases. Today's presentation will be on connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease. I am Dr. Niranjan Jagannathan. I'm the director of the Interstitial Lung Diseases Program at Loma Linda University Health in Loma Linda, California. I do not have any disclosures. Here is the outline for today's talk. We will discuss the prevalence of interstitial lung diseases with different types of connective tissue diseases. We will discuss the clinical signs of underlying connective tissue diseases. We will discuss the chest CT patterns that are commonly seen with interstitial lung diseases related to different types of connective tissue diseases. We will discuss the predictors of ILD progression with connective tissue diseases. We will discuss treatment and we will discuss about interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. As many of you might know, ILD is a broad category which consists of 100 plus different diseases. Interstitial lung diseases or ILD could be further categorized into five main categories. The idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, autoimmune interstitial lung diseases, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, as well as other exposure-related interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, and other rare forms of interstitial lung diseases, such as cystic lung diseases, vasculitis, eosinophilic pneumonias, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Today's presentation will focus on autoimmune-related interstitial lung diseases. There are six types of connective tissue diseases that are commonly involved with interstitial lung diseases that fall in the category of autoimmune ILDs. Rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, SLE, myositis, mixed connective tissue diseases, as well as systemic sclerosis. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features is a research category that was developed or that was first coined in 2015 by American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features or IPAF defines patients with an idiopathic interstitial lung disease with characteristics of underlying autoimmunity but falls short of a definitive connective tissue disease. Prevalence of interstitial lung diseases varies with different types of connective tissue disease. Myositis and systemic sclerosis have the highest prevalence of interstitial lung disease. Myositis, overall, the prevalence is around 40%, but with certain variants such as antisynthetase syndrome as well as clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis, also known as SCADM, the prevalence could be as high as 80 to 90%. With rheumatoid arthritis, ILD could be clinically significant in about 10% of the patients, and in about 30%, even though not clinically significant, it could be noted in uh, CT scan or pulmonary function tests uh, could be consistent with the restrictive pattern consistent with interstitial lung diseases. With Sjogren's syndrome, it could be seen in about 40% of patients. With systemic sclerosis, it could be clinically significant in about 40% but could be present in up to 80% of patients on CT scans or have pulmonary function tests consistent with an ILD. The prevalence is much lower with SLE and reported in about 10% of patients with SLE in several studies. Diagnostic evaluation for patients with interstitial lung diseases requires a comprehensive history as well as examination characteristics, 
that could suggest an underlying connective tissue disease would be a younger age and female sex. Contrary to connective tissue disease related ILD, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis tends to be more common in those older and in males. A comprehensive history inquiring about symptoms and the duration of symptoms, smoking history, exposure history as well as family history is important. Physical exam evaluating for signs as well as symptoms that are consistent with connective tissue disease is important as well when patients are evaluated for an ILD in the clinic. Autoimmune blood work is required and highly recommended by most guidelines, but there is disagreement as to how comprehensive the autoimmune blood work needs to be. At the minimum, it should include ENA, rheumatoid factor, CCP, as well as uh, the myositis panel in most situations. Pulmonary function testing to establish the baseline lung function is important, so these patients could be followed long term to evaluate for progression as well as response to treatment. Here are some common signs and symptoms with connective tissue diseases. So special features that suggest a connective tissue disease would be distal digital fissuring, digital tip ulceration, inflammatory arthritis or morning stiffness, palmar and facial telangiectasias, Raynaud's phenomenon, digital edema, fixed rash on the digital extensor surfaces, known as Gottron signs. Some of the non-specific clinical features would be arthralgias, unintentional weight loss, unexplained fever, dry mouth or dry eyes, dysphagia, oral ulceration, gastroesophageal reflux disease, photosensitivity, alopecia, and proximal muscle weakness. Here are some clinical signs that are commonly seen with scleroderma and includes sclerodactyly, Raynaud's phenomenon, telangiectasias, abnormal nail fold capillaries, and digital ulcer. Some of the clinical signs commonly seen with myositis includes Gottron's papules, heliotrope rash, which is an erythematous rash around the eyelids, mechanics hands, which is the digital fissures. Autoantibodies associated with connective tissue diseases are listed here. Anti-CCP and rheumatoid factor are diagnostic of rheumatoid arthritis. SSA, SSP, also known as anti-Rho and anti-La are seen with Sjogren's syndrome. Patients suspected Having a myositis should have muscle enzymes such as CK and elderlies checked. In addition, myositis antibodies such as anti jo one as well as the expanded my myositis panels, which looks for PL7, PL12, EG, and OJ should be tested for. Systemic sclerosis patients have abnormal anti-SCL70 or anti-centromere antibody. Anti-centromere antibody is associated with limited systemic sclerosis and often associated with pulmonary hypertension, but a significant percentage of patients with limited systemic sclerosis could also have interstitial lung disease. SLE is considered when patients have abnormal ANA or double-strand DNA or positive Smith antibody. Antisynthetase syndrome patients have positive antisynthetase antibody and have a clinical findings which consist of a triad of interstitial lung disease, myositis, and arthritis and could have constitutional symptoms such as fever weight loss and have Raynaud's phenomenon and mechanic sense. It's not important for patients to have all these characteristics present at the same time. 
it's not uncommon for patients to present with interstitial lung disease with the positive anti-synthetase antibodies and then later on develop myositis and arthritis. The table shows the prevalence of anti-synthetase antibodies, the common one, so JO1, PL7, and PL12, but occasionally the other antibodies are detected as well. Anti-PL12, EJ, OJ, and KS antibodies could present with interstitial lung disease alone without the myositis or arthritis. In this review article, they evaluated case series of patients in whom Antisynthetase antibodies were reported, and as you can see, lung involvement is commonly seen with all the different types of antisynthetase antibodies. The diagnostic evaluation of patients with interstitial lung disease should include a high resolution CT scan with ILD protocol. This refers to a high resolution CT scan with thin cuts, typically slices that are less than a millimeter and uh, should be a non-contrast CT scan preferably because contrast can typically give the appearance of ground glass opacities. Patients will have an inspiratory scan but if indicated and expiratory and prone images could also be helpful. Prone images would help with ruling out dependent atelectasis and expiratory images could help evaluate for bronchiolitis or air trapping. Histopathology, biopsy is not routinely recommended for patients with connective tissue disease proven as since interstitial lung diseases are commonly seen with connective tissue diseases. However, if it's an atypical case or patients are progressing or not responding the way you would expect with, many, with treatment of the underlying connective tissue disease, uh, in those situations, a uh, biopsy or an obtaining pathology could be considered. Multidisciplinary evaluation would be gold standard to make a definitive diagnosis in these patients as well as all patients with interstitial lung diseases, but it's important to have a rheumatologist involved to be able to make a definitive diagnosis of connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. When you obtain a CT scan on patients with interstitial lung disease, this, these are some of the common signs that are reported. Honeycombing refers to thin wall cysts that are stacked on top of each other and typically on the peripheral part of the lung. Traction bronchiectasis refers to dilation of the airways due to fibrosis surrounding the airways and it could often extend peripherally to involve the bronchioles and in that situation it would also be called as traction bronchiolectasis. Reticulation refers to thickening of the interlobular or intralobular septum. Ground glass refers to these hazy opacities with preserved underlying architecture and often seen in patients with an NSIP pattern. AR trapping refers to bronchiolitis and uh, often a finding on expiratory images and uh, formed by air being trapped and would present as hypoattenuated areas or darker areas next to normal regions or areas with normal attenuation. Consolidation is a dense opacity and commonly seen with organizing pneumonia. Here are the histological patterns identified by high resolution CT scan and as you can see the histological pattern can vary based on the underlying connective tissue disease. UIP pattern is commonly seen with rheumatoid arthritis whereas non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern is what's commonly seen with other underlying connective tissue diseases. 
Systemic sclerosis commonly presents with an NSIP or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern. With myositis, we commonly see a nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern, but these patients can also have organizing pneumonia more commonly than the other underlying connective tissue diseases. These patients could also present with acute lung injury and diffuse alveolar damage, also known as DAD. Sjogren's syndrome often presents with nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, but these patients also more commonly have lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, which presents as cysts along the bronchioles and pulmonary vasculature. And along with the cyst, there could also be presence of ground glass opacity related to LIP or lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. Patients with SLE can have an NSIP pattern, an LIP pattern, or can present with acute lung injury, which is known as lupus pneumonitis. Patients with mixed connective tissue diseases commonly have an NSIP pattern as well. These pictures show a usual interstitial pneumonia or a UIP pattern, which is characterized by bacillar subpleural honeycombing with traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis. Some of the CT signs could be more commonly seen with connective tissue disease related UIP pattern compared to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In this study, the authors noted that the three signs, the anterior upper lobe sign, exuberant honeycombing, and a straight edge sign was more prevalent in those with connective tissue disease related ILD compared to patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And exuberant honeycombing and straight edge were, sign were, had, a, had the highest specificity um, compared to the other signs. Anterior upper lobe sign refers to fibrosis, in, fibrosis involving the anterior parts of the upper lobe. The straight edge sign refers to demarcation of abnormal and normal areas. Exuberant honeycombing refers to more than 70% of the fibrotic areas having honeycombing. Non-specific interstitial pneumonia or NSIP pattern refers to bacillar symmetric ground glass opacities. And as the condition progresses, patients can develop a fibrotic NSIP pattern which presents with traction bronchiectasis. Patients with an NSIP pattern could also be noted to have subpleural sparing. Organizing pneumonia presents with patchy consolidation, which could be subpleural or peribronchovascular, and the opacities could be migratory. So on CT scans performed at different time points, the opacities could be presented in different areas. Lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia or LIP pattern refers to perivascular or peribronchiolar thin-walled cysts and they could have associated ground glass opacities as well. Again, biopsies are not routinely performed, but on histopathology, certain findings would suggest an underlying connective tissue disease if the clinical signs and symptoms as well as the serologies were not diagnostic of a connective tissue disease. Histological features that would suggest an underlying connective tissue disease are prominent lymphoid aggregates with germinal center with associated peripheral honeycombing fibrosis or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia with organizing pneumonia pattern. Involvement of multiple pulmonary compartments along with interstitial lung disease would also be suggestive of an underlying connective tissue disease. And uh, with connective tissue disease, the multiple compartments involved would be the AR base, vasculature, and the pleura, along with the parenchyma. 
it's very important to have a rheumatologist involved in the evaluation of patients with ILD and in the multidisciplinary uh, evaluation. In this study, 60 ILD patients were evaluated by a multidisciplinary team prior to being referred to a rheumatologist. In a subsequent evaluation by rheumatologists, 21% of the patients diagnosed with IPF by pulmonologists were reclassified. And by having a rheumatologist involved early on in eight patients, procedures could have been avoided. There are certain factors that could be predictive of who would have progression of their ILD. The baseline characteristics would, which could predict progression would be development of ILD at an older age as well as male gender. Certain pulmonary function tests having a low baseline as well as, as, well as rapid progression of FBC and DLCO in a short duration would also be predictive of uh, patients who are likely to have a poor prognosis. The extent of interstitial lung disease and presence of UIP pattern on imaging would also predict likelihood of progression. Certain antibodies have also been associated with higher likelihood of having progression of ILD and the antibodies such as MDA5, Rho52, and PL7. There are different staging systems that have been developed to identify patients with likelihood of progression of ILD. In this simple staging system that was proposed by Dr. Goh's team, categorized patients into limited and extensive disease based on CT scan those who had ILD present or involving less than 20% of the lungs on CT scan was categorized as having limited disease. Those who had involvement of more than 20% of the lungs were categorized into extensive disease. In those with indeterminate level of involvement, lung function tests were utilized. Those with an FVC of 70% or higher were categorized into limited disease and those with FVC less than 70% were categorized into extensive disease. And these patients were followed long term. Those with limited disease had a better survival compared to those with extensive disease and the hazard ratio was 3.46. In a subsequent study, Dr. Go and team evaluated short-term pulmonary function trends as predictors of mortality in interstitial lung disease associated with systemic sclerosis. They looked at a composite categorical decline at 12 months, which they defined as a decline in FVC of 10% or more or a decline in FVC of 5 to 9% and DLCO of 15% or more. Those who had a positive composite categorical decline had worse survival with a hazard ratio of 2.8. There are several other models that have been developed. One of the other ones is called a saddle model, which incorporates smoking history, age, as well as DLCO values. DLCO had the highest weight in the model. Those with high risk category or higher stage was noted to have a increased mortality and mortality of around 55 to 60% was noted at three years. CT pattern could also be predictive of mortality as demonstrated in this study with rheumatoid arthritis. The five-year survival with the UIP pattern was 36%, whereas with an NSIP pattern was around 94%. Organizing pneumonia pattern had a survival rate which was in between and was around 60%. 
patients presenting with diffuse alveolar damage had the worst survival equating to about 20 percent. Those with bronchiolitis and bronchiectis, bronchiectasis also had a better survival compared to UIP or organizing pneumonia or diffuse alveolar damage and that five-year survival rate was around 87 to 88 percent in those with bronchiolitis and bronchiectasis. Treatment considerations. Patients with extensive ILD as well as those demonstrating progression based on pulmonary function tests should be considered for treatment as they are likely to have worse survival. Other factors that are considered would be likelihood of response. Those with a UIP pattern are less likely, less likely, are less likely to respond to respond to immunosuppressives compared to those with a non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern or an organizing pneumonia pattern. Age as well as other comorbidity should be taken into account as well since lot, several of these medications used for treatment are associated with significant side effects. Adherence or likelihood of adherence should be taken into account as well since these medications, since they're associated with side effects, would require close monitoring of blood tests. Type of connective tissue disease could also factor into treatment decisions since some of the evidence for certain medications are only available for certain underlying connective tissue diseases. Management typically includes pharmacotherapy that targets inflammatory and or fibrotic pathways. Supplemental oxygen should be prescribed to patients with resting, hypoxemia, or exertional desaturation. Pulmonary rehabilitation should be recommended to majority of the patients since this uh, therapy could improve their functional capacity as well as help with their psychological health as well. Those with advanced progressive disease should be referred for lung transplantation early on. Those who are not candidates for lung transplantation should be referred to palliative care for assistance with symptom control as well as to facilitate discussions about goals of care and advanced directives. Gastroesophageal reflux disease and esophageal dysmotility could also be seen with patients with underlying connective tissue diseases and more commonly with systemic sclerosis, could present with petulous esophagus on CT scan. As shown in this study, patients with larger esophageal diameter was noted to have more advanced ILD. Those with larger esophageal diameter was also noted to have more rapid progression of their lung function as well as DLCO. Therefore, these patients should be recommended on lifestyle modifications and in certain situations should also consider using acid reducing or promotivity agents. Other pulmonary manifestations related to connective tissue diseases should also be accounted for as their respiratory symptoms as well as decline in pulmonary function tests could be related to non-ILD pulmonary complications. Pulmonary hypertension is common with systemic sclerosis as well as SLV. Bronchiectasis is common with rheumatoid arthritis as well as Sjogren's syndrome. Bronchiolitis could be seen with Sjogren's syndrome as well as with rheumatoid arthritis. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is seen in patients with SLE. Pleural diseases is commonly seen with rheumatoid arthritis as well as SLE. Respiratory muscle impairment is common with myositis. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, also known as IPAF, as I mentioned before, was coined as a research category 
with the goal of following these patients long term and determining their prognosis as well as their response to treatment compared to those with idiopathic ILD and those with more definitive connective tissue disease related ILD. Patients that fall into this category have an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia and they have characteristics of an underlying autoimmune condition but not sufficient to be labeled with the definitive connective tissue disease. Patients should have at least one feature from two of the domains, the clinical, serological, morphological domain. Clinical findings such as digital fissuring, digital tip ulceration, inflammatory arthritis, morning stiffness lasting more than 60 minutes, telangiectasias, Raynaud's phenomenon, digital edema, unexplained rash on the digital extensor surface as the clinical findings. Serologies, as we had mentioned before, uh, the ones that are seen with connective tissue disease. Anti-synthetase antibodies are also included in the serologic domain, but there is uh, disagreement as to whether anti-synthetase antibodies should be included in the IPEF category since there are several experts that would consider a positive anti-synthetase antibody as a definitive diagnosis of anti-synthetase syndrome. Morphologic domain includes radiologic patterns such as NSIP, organizing pneumonia, or LIP, or a histopathology pattern of NSIP, organizing pneumonia, or LIP. Interstitial lymphoid aggregates with germinal centers on histopathology would be also suggestive of an underlying connective tissue disease. And multi-compartment involvement involving the pleura or pericardium Intrinsic airway disease presenting as bronchiolitis or pulmonary vasculopathy would also be um, suggestive of an underlying connective tissue disease. In this study performed by University of Chicago, they retrospectively categorized their ILD patients into IPEF category when they met the criteria that I mentioned before. And when they compare their IPEF cohort to those with IPF and to those with connective tissue disease related interstitial lung diseases, they noted that the IPEF cohort had a slightly better survival than the IPF cohort. However, the survival was worse compared to their connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease cohort. When they divided up the patients with IPEF into those with UIP pattern and those without UIP pattern, IPEF patients with UIP pattern had a survival similar to those with IPF, whereas IPEF patients without UIP had a survival that was similar to those with connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. So in summary, ILD is common with connective tissue diseases, but the frequency could vary based on the underlying connective tissue disease. NSIP and organizing pneumonia are the most common ILD patterns seen. However, with rheumatoid arthritis, UIP pattern could be seen more commonly. Diagnosis and treatment should involve a multidisciplinary approach and include rheumatologists as well. Treatment should be initiated for those with extensive or progressive interstitial lung disease. Pharmacotherapy utilized targets an inflammatory and or fibrotic pathways. Thank you for your time and attention.